Good morning, everybody. I must say, I'm, uh, I'm really impressed to see uh, so many people so early in the morning uh, during the General Assembly where everybody's working uh, from, uh, I was about to say, from morning to morning, and also that you look, uh, all of you, fresh like um, lilies. So, everybody, dear friends, Good morning once again. It is a real pleasure to welcome you to the International Peace Institute and to this high-level discussion organized in collaboration with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Sweden. The topic is, as you all know, the, the future of internet, internet governance, freedom, security and development. I am uh, particularly pleased to welcome my old friend, Foreign Minister Carl Bildt, and to commend him for making this issue such a priority and for bringing it to the attention of the UN community here in New York. I'm also honored to note the presence of the UK Senior Minister for State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, Baroness Worsi, uh, and Denmark's Minister for Development Cooperation, Mr. Christian Fries Buck. Never have information and communication technologies developed as rapidly as they have in the past two decades. If anything, the pace is quickening now, and with it the velocity with which we are confronted with startling new opportunities and new challenges. So this conversation is extremely timely. A UN resolution on internet freedom was adopted in the Human Rights Council in July. It affirmed the applicability of freedom of expression on the internet and urged governments across the world to improve accessibility to the internet. Sweden has shown great leadership on the internet governance issue in international fora including the Stockholm Forum on Internet Freedom for Global Development that took place this past April. At that forum, Carl Bildt eloquently framed the issue and its importance, stating, and I quote, for us, the freedom of the net, of the net and on the net is the new front line in the fight for freedom in the world, unquote. That forum, also addressed another concern that will be central to our discussion today, namely how to make sure that steps to make the internet secure don't end up in restricting free expression. With these words of gratitude to Sweden for its continuing partnership with IPI, and to you, Carl, for your presence here today, I want to turn the meeting over to our um, moderator, IPI Senior Advisor for External Relations, Warren Hoag, who is also a former editor of the uh, New York Times, who will briefly introduce the panelists and then to call on you, Carl, to make the opening remarks for our discussion. Warren, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, just a couple of comments. We want this conversation to be just that, a conversation as highly interactive and inclusive as the medium of communication that we will be discussing today. <coughs> to guarantee the fullest participation, I've asked our speakers to limit themselves to three minutes each, and I ask those of you whom I will call on in the room for comment and questions to limit yourselves to two minutes. And since we are webcasting this live, please wait for the microphone to get to you to speak and then begin by identifying yourself. Now, speaking of inclusivity, my colleague Annie Schmidt here, ultimately, is going to be our digital curator, cataloging interesting tweets and online comments. And I will be turning to her from time to time to see what reactions she's finding in cyberspace and how they might factor into our conversation here. Teria has just spoken of the timeliness of this discussion and your invitation talks about the crucial meeting of the International Telecommunication Union in December in Dubai, where all 193 UN member states will be renegotiating a UN treaty. That treaty now covers telephone, television, and radio networks, but it may be extended to cover the internet. 
raising questions about who should control it and how. I want to add one last very up-to-date element, and that is, of course, the storm over the incendiary anti-Islamic video posted on YouTube. In the aftermath of the violence the video provoked, companies like Google, which owns Facebook, have been challenged over what standards they use to decide what to transmit and whether and what to block and where to block something, and how national laws govern in an area where there are no national boundaries. As you will see, we have assembled an expert and knowing panel to guide us. You have their full biographies attached to the list of attendees, so I will introduce them just very briefly. <coughs> Dr. Hamadoun Touré is Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union that I just mentioned. Dr. Catalina Botero Marino is Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression of the Organization of American States. She, by the way, will be speaking through an interpreter. Dr. James Andrew Lewis, Director and Senior Fellow of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Ross Lajeunesse, Head of International Policy at Google, which I also just mentioned. And to lead us off with opening remarks, Carl Bildt, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden. Foreign Minister, you have the floor. Thanks very much, and thank you, um, everyone, for coming here. Uh, I doubt that this is an audience where I need to spend too much time on uh, speaking about the revolutionary impact of the development of Internet and Internet technologies and what it will mean to um, changing the world. We all know that we are rapidly entering into a world of hyperconnectivity in virtually every respect. There hasn't been a known technology in the known history of mankind that has been introduced as fast as we see these technologies being introduced in the developed, developed world, certainly, but we see it even more rapidly and to some extent even more revolutionary in those parts of the developing world where it's now moving very fast. And we are very rapidly moving into, of course, the mobile technologies of different sorts. I think the developing world will leapfrog into a world of mobile connectivity that is going to affect each and every one. This is tremendous economic importance for the developing countries. Studies by the World Bank, whatever those are worth, but they are studies by the World Bank, indicate that if you have a roughly 10% increase in broadband penetration, you get between a 1.2 and 1.4 increase in the annual growth rate of the economy. And with due respect to everything that we do elsewhere in terms of ODA and whatever it is, I doubt that we can find studies that would indicate such a dramatic effect on economic growth and thus poverty reduction and all of that for a lot of those things as we find for the effects of the penetration of these particular technologies. But it's also, of course, having other social and political effects. Broadly, you can say that what is happening is that networks are challenging, uh, are, are challenging hierarchies everywhere in a number of different ways. That might apply inside the IPI. I don't know. It might apply inside the United Nations. It certainly applies inside societies. It applies in the world at large. This is essentially a good thing, because it empowers individuals and nations and others, but of course it uh, unsettles some of the hierarchies that are then fighting back and trying to preserve the order that they, for the one reason or another, think that they are dependent of. And accordingly, we see increasing eff efforts to uh, limit the freedoms on the net in different uh, respects. Freedom House published its, um, they've done three or four years, I think now they've done these uh, attempt, these studies on uh, freedom on the net. And this year they studied in detail 47 different countries. I think it was 30 countries last year. They're increasing it all the time. Also, by the way, with some support from the government of Sweden. Um, but they found that in 20 of those countries, we now have a negative trend in the sense that in different ways the authorities are trying to control and limit in ways that we would not find particular 
acceptable. And we know that this is probably accelerated across the world as a result of the Arab Spring, which empowered individual but unsettled certain regimes. They mentioned Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, uh, Uzbekistan, and China as just four of the examples where they've seen this trend during the last, uh, last few years. What we've done is that we've tried to bring up these issues primarily within the UN framework, inside Europe as well, but that's somewhat less of a problem, but inside the UN framework. And we succeeded together with an alliance of countries from different parts of the world to get a resolution adopted at the UN Human Rights Council in June, which essentially says that uh, the uh, freedom of expression that is supposedly guaranteed normally in the offline world should be equally guaranteed in the online world. You might argue, well, what are these UN declarations really worth in the normal offline world? Sometimes quite a lot, sometimes somewhat less. But the fact is that we now have a platform of principle from which we can start to deal with the different concrete issues that are there. And we will certainly take that work further in other multilateral and international agencies, bodies, and for us in order to embed that principle more clearly. Then we also need to deal with the governance issues as was indicated, or as is indicated, because there is a debate about the, the governance of the internet. I think that's a healthy debate. It's good that we have the debate, but because for a long time how the internet was governed was a mystery to most. It's still a mystery to some, has to be said, because the governance model is a highly unusual one. This is really a bottoms up, it is a self-regulatory, it is an open, it is a multi-stakeholder approach. And what can be said about that particular one is that it's been spectacular successful in every single respect. It has not impeded the development of the technologies. It has facilitated the spread of the technologies. It has guaranteed the open nature of access to these technologies, but of course there are those who want to control it more. And we are among the ones who say, this has worked pretty good. You can even say spectacularly good so far. Don't rock the boat. Don't mess with what works, but have a debate on it and create the different for us for governments and for others to discuss the future of both the governance and the management of the internet. I'm going to close there just by saying that um, when we, uh, from, uh, from our side, started a couple of years ago to deal with these issues, I said that uh, it's very difficult to make predictions on the state of global politics and things like that. But I was absolutely convinced that these issues were going to be or issues connected with the net in different ways. We have the cybersecurity issues as well, are going to be far, far, far higher on the global agenda a couple of years down the road than they are today. We see that happening, explosion of interest in these issues. And then it's very important that uh, we have a broad debate and that those that uh, share the values of democracy and open societies and freedoms are at the forefront of that particular debate. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Carl. Um, uh, Hamadoun Torre, our next speaker. Uh, Hamadoun, um, uh, Carl Bilt just warned us against making predictions, but I am going to ask you to predict what will be the outcome of this meeting in Dubai in December. And a lot of people are afraid of what could come out of that meeting. Uh, the floor is yours, and uh, I invite you to discuss it. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you. On. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm glad I have this opportunity to mention to talk about uh, this conference because a lot of things are being said about this conference, which has nothing to do with the conference. I met with Pri foreign minister earlier this year when he came to Geneva. Uh, the, uh, I don't know; it's in April or March when you came uh, to Geneva. He came, uh, well, he visited my office and uh, st restated the same uh, concerns, of course. And uh, the ITRs is revisiting a treaty that dates back 1988, at the time, of course, of uh, telephone only, at the time when the uh, measurement between operators and service providers was based on time, distance, and location. Today, we have voice, video, and data all combined. And we know that the 
data traffic is going on a very exponential manner today. The conference in Dubai is revisiting the ITRs because we're afraid down the line there will not be enough infrastructure to carry the data that we see today. That's something that everybody knows and is not about freedom of expression. We're not looking at content at all. Two thirds of the world's population still do not have access to internet. Two thirds of the world population. And most of the connectivity on internet as done through mobile phones today, mobile devices. And the internet world and the telecommunication world need to work together because they are so, they're simply one. They need to work together. And some people, unfortunately, I'm, I, I believe for election purposes, are putting th this issue on the agenda, which is completely out of the picture in ITU. The issue is about affordability. Two thirds of the world people are not connected and the 49 LDC countries, the cost of connectivity to broadband is higher than the monthly income. I just printed, I asked my bill to be printed in, in, the, in the hotel today, coming out this morning, I will be leaving today. My internet connection when I arrived on the 21st for my first device was 38 point 85 dollars and I, I I connected a second device same charge so I paid for three days 70 76 dollars here in New York this is how it is I was in Belgium a few months ago my phone bill was three dollars a minute probably I can afford it because I happen, to, um, I happen to be working in a developed country and in, in an international organization. But most of the people, citizens of this, of this planet cannot afford that. We're talking about affordability here. We're talking about access, accessibility for people with disabilities. And those are real issues that we need to put on the table so that people talk about them. Now, while we are talking about it, people are saying we're looking at freedom of expression. I'm not even equipped for that. I'm an engineer first. I'm a satellite engineer. I have never worked in legal issues. In overall ITU, I only have three lawyers. Three lawyers total. So what I'm trying to tell you here, we're not, the content issues are completely out of our scope. It's not in our agenda at all. The people who are trying to oppose this issue are also saying, oh, in the ITU, this is the United Nations. Oh, if the United States have to be there, they will be uh, uh, outnumbered in a vote where we have one country, one vote system. Some people are even questioning one country, one vote system. US has the same vote as China, six times the population. So. What is, uh, what, what is wrong with one country, one vote? And when was the last time we voted on an issue in ITU? In January this year, we had the World Radio Conference, the largest World Radio Conference, when we, we, we did re re rearrange the spectrum allocation for more bandwidth for broadband. We approved new standard for LTE, the next generation of broadband. Some people call it 4G. We, we agreed on all of those issues. We won one single vote. I brokered a resolution between Israel and Palestine in my office. We didn't have to vote on this. It's the only organization in this world where Israel and Palestine has a common resolution. And you know, US is represented by very fine people. Ambassador Vivier is a very fine man. He's respected in the union. He doesn't have to shout. I call him a gentle giant. He doesn't have to shout to make his voice heard. He makes convincing arguments. This organization is the oldest of the United Nations system, 147 years that we celebrated this year. What does that mean? 
We've, we went through the two world wars. The 70 years or so of Cold War, well, warring parties were coming in an agreement. If not so, satellites would not be co-located next to each other from USSR and, and US. If not, there will be no common standards for telephones, for, tele, for, for, for televisions. There will be uh, 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 frequency jams, spectrum jamming everywhere. It doesn't happen in ITU. We're the only place where Iran will take the floor and support a proposal made by US. It happens every day on our IQ meetings. <clears throat> uh, you would expect the US head of delegation to probably say, I probably may have said something wrong, I, I, I take it back. But no, that happens, and vice versa. Because we are a technical organization and people are trying to drag us into, into political debate. UN Charter, Chapter 19, is very clear about freedom of expression. How can we oppose that? Why should we? First of all, I would like to, before we talk about this, we, I want to have access. And people were trying want to drag us into the internet governance issue. Internet is using telecommunication networks. If you want a, a, an internet connection from a house or a business, new business, the service pro provider will ask you first if you have a telephone line and then they will provide it to you. If you don't have, they will still provide you internet connection, and then they will give you a phone line. The two go, to, go together, and there's nothing wrong with it. They've been working together. Some of the biggest standards that are making the, connect, the connectivity happen today are standards made in ITU, XDSL, the modems. Some of the security standards, they've been all made in ITU hand in hand with, with, with sector members in a multi-stakeholder mode. We're talking, I, I'll finish now. We're talking about multi-stakeholder mode. We are the only UN agency that has 700 private companies in addition to uh, its uh, 193 member states. And the only difference between sector members and governments is when it comes to voting. And as I said, we only vote when it comes to electing me. <clears throat> and the management team and our members of the board on real issues that we never vote. Because voting means winners and losers, and we cannot afford that in making standard. We cannot afford, afford that in managing spectrum. If the smallest island in this world has the wrong spectrum, guess what? The embassy of any country who will be there will not be able to connect back home. And it's not, it's not acceptable. And these are technical problems. All technical problems have technical solutions. S political problems do not have sometimes solutions. And people are trying to drag us into political issues here. We're not equipped for it. Let's work together in a, in a, in a logical <clears throat> mode. We organized the World Summit on Information Society back in 2005, 2003 and 2005. It was the most open conference of the United Nations. For the first time, nobody was demonstrating outside. Why would you demonstrate outside if you can come in an air-conditioned room and speak like anybody else? And that's what we did. Most of you were in Tunis and, and Geneva, and you know what I'm talking about. Why we did that, that uh, we organized the World Summit you know, on Information Society? Back eight years earlier, in 1998, we were reviewing our Maitland Commission report, which was setting a target 20 years earlier a target of every citizen to be within five kilometer distance to a phone, a telephone line. Five kilometers distance. That was said as a, a very ambitious target. Now everybody has a phone in his pocket. At the time we were failing. Why we were failing? Because we said in ITU, we're trying to do this alone. We're in a now multi-stakeholder mode and let's open this to, civ to everyone so that civil society and everyone has come and express themselves. We're entering uh, 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 the information society in Wicked in December. We want to go further. We want to set the stage for the knowledge society where everyone can have access, affordable access, no matter their circumstances, be it in a developing country or having different types of handicaps blind or any type of physical or mental handicaps. This is the mission we're trying to do here. And we're trying to have a sensible debate in this. And we hope that everyone will contribute into the debate so that we can really have some sensible uh, things. And I can tell you, 
a voting in this conference will not happen during my time as Secretary General. If it hasn't happened before, we're not going to outnumber any country because it's not necessary. We only put on our, our, on our uh, resolutions what we all agree upon. And I hope that no one will come to tell us what to discuss and what not to discuss. Because we, we, everyone is free. If we're talking about freedom, the freedom should start with that. And therefore, let's have a sensible debate on this. Well, we have friction of brains and not friction of people. Uh, Hamadoun, thank you for that clarification because, as you know, uh, those groups of people um, who love to think that the United Nations will take over, control, restrict, subvert uh, anything it gets involved in are pointing at that meeting and warning, and warning <laughs> that that's the purpose of the meeting. And I think you've said it quite straight. I thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Dr. Catalina Botero Marino. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the government of Sweden for this and, and IPI of uh, for this generous invitation. And I am also honored of sharing this uh, panel with His Excellency, Mr. Carl Bell, Mr. And I'm also honored of sharing this panel with His Excellency, Ms. Carl uh, Belt, Minister for Foreign Affairs for Sweden, and Mr. James Andrew Lewis and Mr. Ross Gaginis. From now on, I'll speak in my own language, Spanish, so the people who's following us in the region could understand at least part of the conversation. Um, and I would like to thank for the translation services that has been provided. Um, hay al menos dos grandes riesgos There are two big risks in, internet. in the internet. El primero, tiene que ver con su enorme potencial democrático. Eh, ¿Tú traduces al mismo tiempo? O? El primero tiene que ver con su enorme potencial democrático. The first one has great potential. No, lo siento, pero el micrófono no sirve. Yo no te escucho. You can't hear me? Ok. El primer riesgo tiene que ver con su enorme potencial democrático. The first risk has to do with the enormous potential. Democrático. Uh, dem democratic potential. Thank you. Después de la imprenta, probablemente internet es... I, I'm sorry. Después de la imprenta, probablemente internet es el mayor, la mayor herramienta democratizadora que se ha creado. After the press, the internet is probably the largest... Um, Demo eh, yes. <laughs> we'll get the flowers. Sí, yo, yo sigo con usted. Ok. Que es, uh, el internet es lo eh, más grande que se ha creado. Eh, ok. Mm. A mayor capacidad emancipadora o democrática, mayores son las tentaciones well, capacity de restricción. A restrictions. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's, this is working. Hmm? See, it's, I mean, it's working. The do it simultaneously. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not talking about the sound. I'm talking about the translation as a whole. We'll we'll, we'll make it work. Okay. So, the first risk is the huge democratic. I mean, democratic capacity of internet. It means that the government has more temptations to restrict internet. The second risk has to be with the necessity of, um, and let me say this in Spanish for my fellow uh, Americas, uh, South Americas people, eh, la necesidad de evitar the necessity to avoid la, los riesgos the risks de violación de otros derechos a fundamentales. Of other, uh, rights los derechos de los niños, las niñas y los adolescentes the rights of girls, boys and adolescents. y uh, derechos como el derecho a la intimidad and rights like the rights, los derechos de a la intimidad of an intimacy. esos dos grandes riesgos tienen que Those ser two risks controlados have to be controlled a través de la regulación through the regulation y, y 
We have to create a regulation that's capable in order to control the temptations, the authorita authoritative temptations, and to protect the other fundamental rights. The four um, special, reporters. special reporters of uh, freedom of expression, freedom of expression. <laughs> Europe. From Africa, Europe, the and, the and, and the Americas in the United States. We have done uh, a, a, a joint <laughs> declaration in 2011 in order to establish the obligations of the state uh, with respect to uh, the internet governors. I'm going to mention five uh, main principles of, those of that declaration. Principles of that declaration. The, primero, the first one, universality, que tiene que ver con that has to do with infrastructure, de costos, regulation of costs, de uh, measurements of inclusion, como centros, por ejemplo, de acceso a la like centers, free centers, de a la for, for, uh, ac for the population's access. Gran the second big principle es la de is the necessity to apply a interés, a internet, to the internet las reglas, the rules. De el derecho a la libertad de of the right of uh, freedom of expression. La primera, the first one, eh, tiene que ser any restriction has to be exceptional. Debe estar, eh, en una ley it has to be contained within a law que sea en una that would be necessary in a democratic society. La ley debe ser por un the ley un, un has to be applied by a judge o un or an impartial party con de with guarantees of its process. The third, no debe haber para there shouldn't be any responsibility for the intermediaries no that are not responsible of the content that are found on the internet. Y el lugar, and lastly, eh, es el de it's fundamental to uh, guarantee el de the principle of neutrality en internet in the internet. That means basically the need to avoid the discrimination and to guarantee transparency. The uh, joint declaration <laughs> gathers these principles and explains them and develops them and I feel honored in order to be in this conference, in order to discuss those principles with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Catalina. And that's a nice segue to our next speaker, uh, James Andrew Lewis, because uh, I have written things he has written, and he's written about how the West at first wanted no control of any kind, the least possible control, and then suddenly security concerns reared their ugly head, and some form of control, though not controlled over content, became necessary. So with that uh, introduction, James, take it away. Uh, Thank you, and uh, good morning to you all. Thanks for coming out so early, and let me thank both the government of Sweden and IPI for having me here. Um, I want you to think about a few concepts, and I am going to keep it short. Um, what has happened is that the governance structure that came out of the 1990s, uh, came out of a very American, very West Coast setting, is no longer adequate for what has become a mature global infrastructure. And it's that inadequacy that is driving our debate. I have to get really close? All right. How about this? <laughs> um, so it's inadequate governance for what is truly a global infrastructure that is at the core of economic and political <coughs> activity and with real security concerns. The biggest single change that we have seen is the extension of sovereignty. So people started out by saying the internet didn't have borders and government had 
had no role, and it turned out it wasn't true. The internet does have borders. It's based on a physical infrastructure. And so we won't see a big bang. You're not going to wake up one day and see that there's total sovereign control over the internet. But you're seeing national law being extended into this space. You're seeing sovereignty return to the norm that it is in any other kind of international activity. And that is one of the changes we have to deal with here. Governments have concerns, they're legitimate. This means that in our debate, we will need to redefine what multi-stakeholder governance means. The model inherited from the dawn of the internet, which was really only about 15 years ago, um, doesn't work anymore. It's inadequate for security. It works great on the technological issues, right? The IETF, if you know what that is, they've done a tremendous job. Why should we replace them? But in other areas, there's a need for something new. Now, the move to a new model of governance is complicated by a political agenda, and we don't want to deny that or ignore it. And the fundamental issue is universal rights versus sovereign control. A good example of this might be in the code of conduct that some people have put forward, some countries have put forward. I love it. My favorite provision is that um, it says, uh, access to information is guaranteed to everyone. Great. Guaranteed to everyone, comma, subject to national law. No! <laughs> it's either a universal right or it's not. And we've all theoretically agreed to universal rights. And what you're seeing is an erosion of that agreement. And we're having a difficult time dealing with the move from a uh, world where the transatlantic community could set norms, could set values, to one that's a global community that doesn't necessarily shame, share the same values and norms. And this will be a difficult transition, and internet governance is part of that transition. You can have countries that are democratic, but have very different cultural beliefs, very different attitudes towards content, and that will be a hard thing to deal with. It's something that our current model of governance is inadequate for. So when I look at this, um, you know, I think that there was a sense at the end of the Cold War that uh, democracy had triumphed, right? And that now all countries in the world would be democratic. And I agree with Minister Bilt, that's no longer true. Uh, democracy is being challenged again. Justice is being challenged again. Um, we have not seen a final victory in this. And part of the dilemma in moving to a more mature model of internet governance that takes into account the concerns of national sovereignty and is adequate for what has become a crucial global service is that this political agenda means if we get this wrong, it will be a less democratic environment. And that is not an outcome that I think any of us really want. Well, almost any of us. Right? Um, so that is, for me, the fundamental issue here. Sovereignty, uh, universal rights, uh, moving to a new model of governance that retains the democracy and openness that we've come to expect. Why don't I stop there? Very good. Thank you very much, James. Ross La Jeunesse, um, actually in the most recent instance of the, uh, the reaction to the video, you at Google did have to respond to national laws, did you not? Hi, um, we did. Uh, let me uh, address that first. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the government of Sweden, the foreign minister, and IPI for inviting me to be part of a truly outstanding panel. I'm honored to, to join you up here on stage today. Uh, Another point I want to make before I address your question is just to state for the record that we don't own Facebook. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I think you meant to say YouTube. Um, oh. So I, I know everyone in the room knows it, but I feel like I have to go on record to just <laughs> set the record straight, perfectly straight. Um, in general, we, we abide by the laws in those countries in which we operate. Um, so in countries where we have a physical presence and we're subject to their jurisdiction and we get a valid court order or a valid government directive to, for example, block access to a video, we are forced to comply. The point I want to make is that we do not just do this. Um, we don't just fold the minute a request comes in. We look at it very carefully. We run it by our lawyers many times. The conversation uh, usually is escalated to the very highest levels of the company before a decision is made to take that video down. Um, and that's something that I personally am very proud of. 
uh, because there are many companies and situations in which that sort of debate would not happen. But we take our responsibility in this area very seriously. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions that the audience might have. One of the benefits of, of going last on a panel like this is I get to basically throw out the statement that I, that I prepared and, 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 and keep it short and just address a couple key elements. To, to build on, on the foreign minister's comments, the internet is really powerful stuff. And I know we all know that, but it, I, I think it's always a, a good thing to be reminded of, of exactly um, how powerful it is. By, by 2016, in the G20 alone, the internet is going to be driving about $4.2 trillion of economic activity each and every year. And that's just in the G20. And more importantly, then the numbers at any given point are, are you, look at, you look at the charts of where that is going, and the, the growth is exponential. We've never seen anything like it before. Just as important as the economic figures is the fact that we've never seen uh, a technology or any, anything else, for that matter, that has broken the boundaries uh, between cultures and worlds like the internet has. There's never been something of this, uh, of this nature that, that allows people to communicate and promotes cross-cultural understanding. There's, it's, it's completely unprecedented. And we all know that and we say, yeah, 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 I get it. But it's important, I think, to remind ourselves at, about what's at stake when we talk about issues like internet governance and when we have debates like this, because that is what's at stake. Now, so something this powerful is only powerful because it's also disruptive, right? It upends every, every existing model, economic and otherwise, that the world has seen. And when something like that happens, there are winners and there are losers, and people are upset, and people try to hold on to the old ways of doing things. And that's, that's the natural course of, of it all, right? And debates like this are, are, are part of that change as well. And, and I agree with the foreign minister's statements and, and the secretary general's statements that this debate is positive and it's necessary. There's no other way to get to where we want to go without having conversations like this. So I'll just say a few more things. When something is this disruptive, there are challenges. There are bumps in the rows that arise. There are problems that need to be addressed. First among these challenges, I would agree with the secretary general, is that ensuring that the amazing opportunities that all of us in this room are enjoying are also uh, made available to the five billion people in the world right now without internet access. I'd say that's, that's one of our primary challenges. Otherwise, they'll just be left farther and farther and farther behind. But there are other challenges, cybersecurity, um, intellectual property regimes that balance the rights of users and creators bullying and hate speech, standards and protocols. So yeah, there are a lot of issues, and they need to be addressed. But let's be sure that the solutions we reach don't do more harm than good. And let's be sure that in seeking these solutions, that we continue engaging the same tools and the same stakeholders that have brought us and brought the internet to this remarkable point where we are today. You know, the tools and stakeholders, um, as the minister said, are what have brought the internet to where it is now. And they've allowed us to address many past issues while maintaining the internet's innovation and growth. You know, the solutions to date have come from a combination of internet users themselves, uh, from private companies, from governments, and from a very robust and useful multi-stakeholder community that have included organizations such as the International Governance Forum, ICANN, I mean, it becomes an alphabet soup, but lost in, lost in the letters is the fact that this is a very effective community that has solved many issues to date, and I think is the appropriate forum, or, and together are the appropriate fora, for addressing the concerns and challenges that we're gonna face in the future, because it's all worked very, very well. I'm going to cite one example. In 2009, we saw the rise of the Conficker botnet, which was at the time the most advanced virus anyone had seen. It had already infected about 200, million, uh, 200 countries, the millions of computers, including government, private industry, business, home machines. 
In response, a working group was developed, was established, and it was made up of private sector companies like Microsoft and Symantec, academic researchers, NGOs like ICANN, and volunteer internet security workers. And governments also participated as well. And the working group, despite its odd um, genesis, was incredibly effective. Within weeks, it had shut down one of the major strains of that virus, and it was able to coordinate and collaborate with over 100 countries in blocking 50,000 malicious domains per day. Now, while this virus is still ongoing, I want to point out that this is the type of rapid response that works. And it's an example of how industry, academics, government, and volunteers can get together really quickly to stop a new problem. Now, this is not to say we're always going to have all the answers or that the answers will be immediately apparent or easy to find, but we will get there. And the processes and the actors in the multi-stakeholder environment that have served us so well to date are the best way of doing that. So we need continued evolution I would, I would posit not revolution in how we continue advancing the role of the internet. Uh, thank you, Ross. We have three ministers in the audience uh, who will be speaking just for two minutes each. Uh, the first is Baroness Worsey of the UK. And if you would wait for the microphone, and as I explained to her, I'm going to have her face you, the audience, and the camera. Uh, well, thank you very much, and uh, the fantastic thing about speaking after so many great speakers is that you've uh, said everything that I was going to say, um, so I can keep it uh, very, very short. On a very personal level, the internet affects all of our lives, and we worry, we are fascinated with what opportunities it presents, but we're also worried uh, as to the challenges it presents, whether uh, I wake up and I'm concerned about what my children can access, and whether I'm ever going to get one step ahead of them as to what they can access, uh, whether we are concerned about how much of our busy lives are now run on the internet, but constantly concerned about how much of our identity is therefore subject to, uh, to risk, uh, or whether as a politician on a political basis, um, I'm fascinated and hugely supportive, and I take the Secretary General's point that this is all about making sure more of the world have access and have good access. But in doing that, uh, of course, the issues of national security uh, come to light. Um, and uh, I think the, the only point that I, I want to make is that where there are different views around the world, as to what freedom of expression actually means um, and how uh, the internet needs to be supported for its positive, but some protections need to be put in place. Um, what uh, fora is the right fora for these discussions to take place? Uh, and of course, I accept that there are predominantly technical discussions that will take place uh, in Dubai rather than in relation to content. But how do you feel you will deal with those challenging differing positions? Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Baroness. Uh, the Danish Minister, Christian. Thank you very much. Well, also, thank you very much to the panel for a very inspiring uh, uh, set of interventions. And that's what I came for. I came to listen. Now, before I became a minister, I was actually, amongst other things, running a small startup company uh, doing a, a smartphone based reporting tool. Uh, and that opened my eyes to two things. Firstly, the vast innovation that you see, extremely inspiring everything, of course, citizen journalism, crowdsourcing, election monitoring, you know, uh, social auditing, all of it. Vast innovation, especially in developing countries, you know, I was extremely inspired by that. But the other thing that it opened my eyes for was that when I had lunch with my developers, these young guys in sweaty t-shirts, uh, sitting over the computer all day developing the things we were doing, the discussions was always on new restrictions, new constraints, new barriers, new types of registrations that they tried to fight against. Uh, and those, some of them were specific, some of them were generic, some of them had to do with intellectual property rights that perhaps are not well suited for the speed of the internet uh, that we see today. And I think that's an issue we, I would like also to hear your comments uh, on. Uh, now, I've become a minister and traveling around, I see the same inspiration all over the place and I see the same worries. And in some countries more than others, uh, try attempts and attempts to try to restrict and constrain and register and all of it. And it's a constant battle and we definitely need to fight against it. Uh, and we believe in a rights-based strategy. It has to do with transparency. It's all about uh, internet as well. It has to do with accountability, 
being able to keep uh, leaders and governments accountable, and it has to do with participation. And on all these three issues, I do believe that we have the ICT revolution will revolutionize a rights-based strategy as well, but we definitely need to keep the fight for openness and transparency and participation and accountability. Uh, and we have to engage in that fight every single day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And finally, we have from Mara Marinaki from the EU. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like uh, to thank IPI and uh, Minister Bildt uh, for giving us uh, the opportunity of uh, having this discussion today. I would like to start with uh, an old but uh, always pertinent axiom that in nature there is no vacuum. So we should uh, take into consideration the fact that uh, uh, irrespective of the ways that we use, uh, in any case, uh, we will see that uh, things will take their course uh, despite all attempts that might be made uh, to prevent things from happening. I agree that it is evolution rather than a revolution that should be called for. Um, we see that uh, we have had uh, a very constructive uh, cooperation up to now from uh, the part of governments, the private sector and civil society, all three of them merging in uh, a very constructive and forward looking cooperation in a smooth exchange of roles, molding into each other's um, competencies, and finally having a, a new formation of a cooperation that needs to find its definition and that needs to find a proper term of reference, but nevertheless is already in place and has already been uh, implemented with quite a lot of success. From the part of the European Union, we have been uh, the forerunners with all our 27 soon to become 28 member states uh, of these efforts. And uh, in this sense, we have been also quite pioneering in areas as it is the code of conduct uh, uh, in outer space, where we try to establish forms of cooperation among states uh, that would facilitate the access to outer space in all forms of development that would make satellites a thing uh, that would have a wider access to all countries in the world so that communication would become even more uh, accessible to states that not yet have this kind of, of an access. This is an effort that uh, we are glad that we have gathered around the table um, all the uh, countries that are already uh, engaged in uh, satellite uh, uh, development. Uh, and in this sense, uh, we have had countries that do not always see eye to eye on areas that have to do with a more uh, narrow scope scope, let's say, of accessibility or of issues pertaining to uh, intellectual property rights or cybercrime. But nevertheless, all see the dangers. And in this sense, we all uh, um, feel that we should join forces. So we are proud in taking this initiative, which we have, of course, put at the service of the United Nations in its uh, further elaboration. And we hope that in this sense, the third element of today's discussion that has to do with development should should be the one that would be underlined in more uh, um, effective terms. How the countries that are developing countries would most benefit in the wider sense of gaining access, of gaining all these, um, uh, let's say, positive privileges uh, that most of us consider as a given, but definitely this is not the case. Having witnessed uh, effects as it has been the case recently for uh, people staying overnight to buy a new uh, model of uh, a mobile phone. This uh, sounds uh, quite a normal thing to happen in a city like New York. I'm not sure that this is the case in other regions of the world uh, that do not have this kind of, uh, let's say, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, acquaintance with all these forms. So in this sense, I feel that governments should be also uh, entrusted to, to grow with the, the developments, to grow with the needs of the time and to be able to adapt uh, in areas where up to now they have been rather protective of their own rights, rather protective of their own limited competence. And uh, these discussions like today, I hope that will help 
to make governments, to make uh, uh, the major stakeholders see the light. And to this end, the European Union will uh, continue to be of, um, uh, let's say, of help uh, to the United Nations and to the international community in all its forms. Thank you very Maria, much. Maria, thank you very much. I'm going to go to the floor now, and actually, we're going to go beyond the floor, because I'm going to ask Annie Schmidt, who has been monitoring the Twitter feeds, to uh, tell us a question from, where is it from? Do you know? Uh, well, I don't know. The lady asked me if Oh, sorry, um, I'm not sure who it's, uh, where it's from, but it's from a religious, and he asks, will societies become more uniform or more polarized as freedom of speech can both confirm and deny others' prejudices? Would you like to take that question? I think you, I think it will be both. Um, uh, societies are becoming both more global and more local at the same time. I mean, that sounds uh, somewhat of a contradiction, but I think that is the tendency that we see. Uh, look at the politics of the different countries of the European Union, to take that as just one example. We see increased emphasis on regional identity autonomy developing in different countries. At the same time, as you have an awareness of Europe working together, and the world as the arena for things to do. So it's going to be sort of a contradictory approach. It's going to be both of these things happening at the same time. And of course, sometimes the problem is going to be that there's going to be too much of the one or too much of the other, and then we're going to get the conflict. But inherently, if we look at the development of societies, we are becoming both more local, more regional, and more global at the same time. I mean, this is the world of hyperconnectivity. Uh, yeah, of course. Actually, I've had three people want to answer that question. Uh, Hamadoun? Okay. No, I, I wanted to answer the question by uh, asked by Baroness, so I will let you go on this floor so that we don't uh, lose the f floor. For and I'll be quick. Um, you know, the people thought the Internet would be a democratizing force, and it is in the sense that there are now more participants in political dialogue, and so that's a good thing. Um, where it's not a democratizing force is that these participants don't share the same values. They don't necessarily believe in democracy. So I think it maybe to build a little bit on Minister Bild's remarks, I think it'll be sequential. You're going to see more participants, but it will be more polarized, right? And over time, perhaps, we'll see the emergence of some more universal values. But I wouldn't. I don't think it's going to be more polarized. We're going to see that the world is polarized. I mean, pe people that are appearing on the net that we now see in the sort of remote corners that we were not aware of before, to exaggerate somewhat, they have views that we were not aware of. Certainly, we become aware of them, and we are confronted with them. So it's not the net creating a polarization. The net is exposing a polarization that is there in societies and in the world. And hopefully, over time, sequentially, as you said, we are able to bridge the differences. Yeah, I would just add to this uh, debate the fact that really we need to make sure that while we are doing all this, that we, st we learn to respect one another. I think uh, there, is a, there are so many things in common that we tend to focus on the little differences and sometimes be a little bit abusive and necessarily. And while, how can we come bring down the debate really on those issues to a more respectful manner where we know we're going to respect each other's views and even then they can, they're different. You know, most of the countries have restrictions on some, of some sort or of not, or, or, or another. A restriction on copyright or protecting copyright, a restriction preventing defamation. Uh, restriction of, on, on pornography, and certainly on child pornography. Some have some sort of restriction on gambling, hate speech, the negation of, uh, of genocide, or circulation of abusive pictures uh, of children. Those are things that are in many countries that are, you know, counted as abusive, and there, I think, we should protect them. So. There is nothing wrong with that. So, and I, I would like us to just have the debate in a positive manner, not trying to accuse one another, 
trying to see our lowest common denominators. That what I, you know, when I was di di uh, discussing the cybersecurity inside the ITU, I, I, I was confronted with a uh, uh, lot of uh, oppositions be be between our members on the ethical side of crime, which is normal. I ended up just getting grabbing uh, what I call our lowest common denominator, child online protection. I said, let me find something in, that we have in common that we're gonna put on the table so that we work as we talk. Because as we were debating endlessly, criminals are working against our children, our businesses, and our uh, 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 and our societies. So I tried to find the low hanging fruit where we can have something really tangible, and. Exactly to respond to the question by uh, 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 the Baroness is that in Dubai, I hope to bring uh, the various uh, debates onto what, uh, the areas where we have some common denominators. And I'm sure we have. We have so many things in common, but we, 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 it's not human that we, we, we tend to, 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 to spend more time debating on what, what we disagree on. It's, it's that's why divorces happen even in real nature. nature. You know, if you see a family breaking up, but they have so many things in common. So I, I am f f uh, convinced that we, there are many things that are on the table that we all agree on, and that's what we put in the uh, convention in, 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 uh, in Dubai. And it should be on major principles, not too many detailed. It's, if, it's, if it's detailed, it will be obsolete before even the ink dries. We know that. So we're going to be having some key principles that we all agree upon that can last longer. Otherwise, it will not. It will not. Uh, uh, will not have an agreement at all. So I'm. Com I'm convinced that we have had that in the past, and there's nothing wrong with getting it again. And the same type of debates were back in 1988. I, I, I have investigated how was the atmosphere back in 1988, what they were doing the ITRs the first time. It was the same type of confrontations, but we ended up having a good agreement that lasted 24 years. And I hope that the one that we're going to have here will also bring us in soon some common principles. And we always find those. Uh, the key issues on, uh, on, on cybersecurity, for instance, uh, when the debate were going on, I was trying to find, again, our common denominators. What are the key principles we agree on? Uh, that's where we came with code of, code of conduct. I was debating the issue of code of conduct, common code of conduct. The, the, it was the minister, prime minister of Tunisia who actually uh, told me when I was doing one of my discussions, said, I'm having difficulty bringing people to debate this issue. He said, look, look here, people will have difficulty going for a, a, a treaty in cybersecurity. They have difficulty with that. Go with something like a common code of conduct. Oh, that's soft. Maybe everybody will agree on that. And I started debating it uh, uh, internally. And unfortunately, a few countries uh, liked it, took it the, to the uh, Security Council. Of course, it was dead because of it was brought by a specific group of countries. But the issues that we, everybody is talking about are the same. It's, it's kind of monologues on the same issues. They don't listen to each other. So I'm trying to find a tangible debate here so that we can really have some, some common things that we can agree on. Thank you. I have a question in the third row. Amr, if you would uh, stand, please identify yourself. It's difficult to stand because I have my laptop. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm trying good. to be yeah. online here. You but, know. But, but you're but holding the microphone. That's good. Thank you very much um, for this very interesting uh, seminar. Um, it offers um, as fresh thoughts as those across the street. Two, two quick questions. Um, one, uh, two. And please do identify yourself. So my name is Amr al -Gouili. I'm uh, the counselor of the Egyptian mission uh, here in New York. One question to Secretary General Toure. I participated in, in the two world summits on information society, Tunis and, um, and Geneva. And there are many paragraphs there that states, um, you know, negotiated for months and years, and yet that don't see I um, haven't seen implementation even if almost 10 years after. I refer, for example, to paragraphs in the internet governance, like paragraph 65, which deals that internet governance should take into account the uh, interests of developing countries, the enhanced cooperation 
uh, the whole enhanced cooperation track. So how do you see the implementation of the World Summit on Information Society almost um, uh, 10, 10 years uh, after? Another question to basically um, uh, Mr. Lewis, but also to, uh, to Mr. Toure is, um, how is the interconnectedness between the efforts of the ITU on one hand and the efforts of the UN in general? For example, there's the governmental group of experts on information security uh, and the developments of ICTs. How is the ITU involved or not involved, or how should there be uh, linkages between both? Thank you very much again Thank for the seminar. Thank you, Amir. Amadun, you want to take those two questions and then we'll get some more. The first one is a very difficult one because when I start talking about IEF, they will say, oh, again, you see, I, I told you, uh, UN wants to take over the internet governance again. And, and the internet governance has three components. One, the IANA function. Two, the ICANN existence. And three, the ICANN very sign agreement. Those are the three main issues. And those are, believe, being discussed in a completely different track. And I feel nothing wrong with it, and we don't need to debate it during the wicket. We're talking about access. We're making sure that people have a, 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 a real access that is uh, uh, affordable. The, during the WISIS, the IGF process was put in place. And I believe that's one area, the Internet Governance Forum, that's one area where Internet Governance issues are being discussed. Next one will be in, in Baku in early October or November. And I hope to be present again as I have attended all of the IGF meetings because we are one of stakeholders as well. If it's multi-stakeholder, no one should say that I shouldn't talk about it because I'm a stakeholder too, like anybody else. So we are discussing in, the, in the, that framework. So I don't go any further because I don't see any need for ITU to, to have any more role because, and I've said that in our plenipotentiary conference in, in 2010, before my re-election, at the plenary session, and our members still uh, elected me. So I, I, I believe that uh, this, this is, there are two parallel tracks that needs to continue, and the debates are continuing the IGF process, and it is a multi-stakeholder, and all civil society come in and, and talk about it. On the information security, ITU was assigned two action lines among the 11 action lines, action line C2 on infrastructure, and action line C5 on cybersecurity. And that's one. That's why I, after my election, I created the uh, a, a cyber security agenda, the global cyber security agenda, GGCA, to debate the issue. D debates were becoming political, and since we're not political, we're not equipped with, with that. I created the uh, how, what I call the high-level expert group. I said technical people will not be uh, discussing political issues. I was wrong. The, same issues came on. In it. That's why we ended up on this with child online protection, so that I could I could find something where people will have something uh, tangible to do that is of interest to everyone. And guess what? If we are able to put a good framework to protect children in, th in the cyberspace, I believe the same framework can work for anything else. As we will start learning to understand each other, to know each other. So those are the approaches we are trying to take in a very positive manner, so that we really find solutions. And children as are our common denominator. They are the future. They are the one, ones using the net more than anybody else. They are the ones likely to give information on themselves uh, to people they have never met online. We have, we, we, we have to teach them that what's good offline is also good online. And what is bad offline is also bad online. So to, to learn those kind of behaviors. So, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to do something concrete while we're talking. And I'm, I'm from a, 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 originally from a least developed country. And I'm making sure that we all have access. When ministers were asking me about uh, internet governance in, in, during the uh, uh, WISIS process, I was telling them from developing countries, don't talk about internet governance. Get internet first. Get your people connected. Let's work together to make sure your people are connected. And then you'll talk about the governance. It will come later. And in fact, I can say something again, uh, one last thing here. Nobody can control the net anymore. If any country thinks he's controlling the net, he's fooling himself. It cannot be done. During the Arab Spring, I said that 
the uh, today the information and communication technology is a very powerful tool in the hands of people governments if governments take it away it becomes a bomb in their hand and it's ready to explode and it's exploded in those hands who have taken it away that's what happened and that will continue and everybody understand that I have at least two questions, but first Ross and or James, and then Ross, you'd Let like to. Let me touch uh, briefly on the group of government experts, which I won't comment on since I'm okay, involved in it. Put me on the list for some. But I will say that uh, we're completing research okay, that shows that there is public information on 12 countries having offensive cyber military capabilities. Another 41 countries have some kind of military doctrine. This has become an issue for international security, mm -hmm. and one size does not fit all. It would not be appropriate for the ITU or for corporations to be involved in issues that are political military or involve security. Um, we need to stop trying to cram everything into a single box. This is a military issue. There are four sets of negotiations going on, the GGE, in the OSCE, in the ASEAN Regional Forum, which I spoke at two weeks ago, and a little bit in the OAS, right? Plus a set of bilateral negotiations, including the US and Russia and the US and China. So we have a separate track that deals with international security. And it is not something that really fits that well into the governance debate because it is part of the traditional debate we have on international security. I, uh, more than a statement, I actually was hoping to get a clarification and, and, and maybe make a point by asking the question. But, uh, you know, uh, the Secretary General has said that, <clears throat> that the ITU is continually being dragged into these political issues and, and that you want to focus primarily or exclusively on access issues. But then I also hear him say that about, talk about the need to do something concrete and to address child safety concerns. And I, 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 I suspect that that's one of the reasons why many people in the room are wary of the ITU's involvement, because I, I, don't, I see a conflict there. If you're talking about not wanting to get involved in internet governance, and then you go on to say we need to do something concrete to protect children, I think that's where some of the concern lies. Uh, and Catalina would like to say something as well, and then I have two questions. Yes. yes. Uh, Maybe internet is a young, a very young tool, but the fight for our freedom has been very long. So we have some achievements, um, and what, what we're trying to do as a special reporters is to apply those achievements, so international law, to national regulations. We do have, whether we like it or not, national regulations. So we need to make them transparent, and we need them to be, uh, I mean, we, we need them to apply international law. I think within international law, we do have some answers for the questions that you have raised here. Uh, maybe we need to do something to apply those standards to internet. But it's not, I mean, we do have the principles. And I think sometimes we need to back to the classics. Thank you. These were the last two questions. Gentlemen in the second row, we'll take them back to back, and then Angela Kane. Thank you. Thank you very much for the floor. My name is Pavel Fischer. I will have a question to Mr. Ross Lajeunesse. But let me introduce myself. I come from the Czech Republic, a country with a rather interesting know-how in, for instance, antiviruses programs free of charge and a country which is engaged also in promoting human rights via internet. Some of our embassies work like a cyber cafes in regimes with dictatorship, and we strive to be useful as far as possible in promoting freedoms. Uh, my question is the following one. You can, let me imagine that you have a possibility, Mr. Lajeunesse, to have a meeting with the Secretary General of UN. What should be the emphasis uh, you put forward in terms of agenda setting, uh, steps or thresholds uh, to be uh, focused on uh, from the point of view of UN? Uh, what should be uh, the, the themes you would like to focus UN activities, or maybe you should uh, just prefer to meet someone else uh, 
Secretary General of uh, OECD or G20 or someone else? What should be uh, your choice? Thank you very much. Uh, hold that thought, Ross. Uh, Angela Kane. Thank you very much. I'm Angela Kane. I um, work for in disarmament in the United Nations, but I've been quite involved in internet issues, and I basically have uh, two issues. First of all, I want to come back to what the minister said about the young people. And I find it very interesting because he's absolutely right. Young people want to have more access to the internet. In my country, in Germany, there was a party that was created on the sole platform of wanting to have more access to the internet. It was the Pirates Party, and they got a very respectable <laughs> showing uh, in, the, in the parliamentary elections. Now, that might have been a flash in the pan, but I think it gives you an indication of what there is out there. And the other, they wanted to raise two other aspects that were not talked about, because we've talked a lot about actually negative impacts also of the internet. I'm very leery of code of conducts, because by the time the ink is dry on these code of conducts, first of all, they very often serve to restrict rather than expand. But I think our Egyptian colleague talked about something that was negotiated 10 years ago, which is now implemented. And I think that's what you will probably see, that maybe a code of conduct, if it can be agreed on, is very short of duration, and then it's going to be superseded very quickly. But there are two other aspects. One is negative and one is positive that I see that haven't been mentioned. One is the whole financial network now depends on the internet. Mm -hmm. There's lots of issues in there in terms of privacy of information, in terms of collapse of that information. And I think that that's something that really needs to be attended to. But the other aspect, which is positive, which also hasn't been mentioned, is the fact of education. There are huge numbers of courses out there on the internet. I think there's a huge potential. I would like to see that really expanded. I would like to see that that is being worked on. And very often, it's not only done, I'm not talking about universities, there are also individuals who are doing courses. I'm thinking of the Khan Network, for example. There are huge numbers out there. And I don't really see that that is being talked about a lot. And I don't think that we're dealing with it really in the international community. So I wanted to put that on the, on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela. Um, Ross, if you would answer the first question. And I wanted Carl Bilt to have the final word. So Carl, if you wouldn't mind, I'd ask you to take Angela's <laughs> question and then shape that question into what you will see at the very end. Um. Thank you for the question. I think my, if I were in, uh, in a position to meet with the UN Secretary General, uh, I think my messages would be the same that I delivered here today, which is to recognize the incredible, not just the unprecedented achievements that the internet has brought to the world, but also its potential uh, for coming years. And to focus on the five billion people in the world who currently don't have access to this amazing tool, but, but in addressing that access gap, to be very careful and to let the current structures and stakeholders which have brought the internet to its current state continue to do our work into the future because these are the stakeholders and the processes that have managed to grow the internet so exponentially, so quickly as the foreign minister said without stifling its innovation, while maintaining its status as an incredible tool for human rights, the advancement of human rights and free communication and cultural understanding. Well, a lot has been covered. I asked a couple of remarks on, 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 on some of the major issues. One is, uh, needless to say, the freedom issues. I think we agree that uh, we must protect online what we've been trying to protect offline. But as the word is moving online, the protection there becomes, as we said, the new front line in the fight for freedom across the world. There are standards that can be applied. And we have lots of international regulations, documentations, declarations. And to have it sort of broadly accepted that those apply online is important. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the debate that we're having these very days, that there are certain restrictions in, even in Sweden, we have certain restrictions, believe it or not. Uh, we are among one of the freest countries in the world concerning this. They are somewhat different in different countries. And that, of course, presents uh, Google and others with certain challenges. I think the way you should do it, and I think that's the way you do it to a certain extent, but just to reinforce it, is when you are forced by legal authorities in a legal way to take something off, you should make that known. 
So there is the yeah, trans and, uh, yeah. transparency report. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, absolutely. But uh, Twitter the same. They have a very elaborate policy on how they do it, um, which I think is excellent. So that we know when it's done, and that people know when it's done and what is done. Um, and that could then facilitate a debate in the respective countries whether this is the right or the wrong thing to do, because it is a tricky thing. I mean, it's been extremely tricky these particular days just to make one example. We have the famous film, but we have another case that's been going on in Europe uh, concerning whether one can publish pictures of royalty uh, with less than complete uh, clothes on. Um, <laughs> And, and I mean, try to sort out the two principles that apply here and um, inform me about the results if you can. Um, then, the, uh, uh, which I think is the key issue that has been also mentioned, uh, facilitate affordable access is clearly key. Um, I, I think the example of the hotel in New York being expensive, that problem is going to disappear fairly fast. Because with mobile networks being more effective, hotels will not be able to charge these things. Um, so uh, if the Hyatt is expensive, um, they will lose the ability to even charge for that money five years from now with the way mobile technologies are developing. And that's my point. Technology is moving extremely fast. It is now moving faster access in Africa than anywhere else. But it's different in different parts of Africa. Because in certain parts of Africa, development of fiber cable connection has been exceedingly slow because a couple of governments wanted to control the entire thing and it was very, very slow. Now it's taking off, off with new cables on both sides of Africa. Then if you go to different African countries and some of us travel around, we do see the difference in accessibility on the mobile networks. As a general rule, you can say that if you have a government trying to control by having a monopoly that is government owned, then accessibility is very bad, expensive and moves slowly. Um, if you have a country where there is much more sort of freedom to establish and freedom to within sort of you must have frequency allocation and those sorts of things, then you have a more rapid development. Uh, one of the countries which has the most rapid development of mobile connectivity at the moment is Somalia because they have no restrictions whatsoever. They are doing it. While I can mention a couple of other countries, which is far more of regulation, where governments are trying to have monopolies and milk it of money, and where affordability is much more difficult, accessibility much more difficult, and the development much slower. And I think that's something to be taken into account when we discuss the developments. Then, as has been alluded to, there are other issues as well. I mean, the cybersecurity concerns is not only a sort of the the rather extravagant sort of uh, cases that we've seen, and one of them was mentioned here. But it is the fact that, uh, as I said, we are going into hyper-connected world, a hyper-connected world. And it's not only human beings, it's uh, devices that are being connected. Accordingly, the security of our societies is going to be a function to a large extent of the security of the networks. So it is both the freedom on and the security of the nets that are going to be critical. This applies to, Angela mentioned, education. A spectacular examples of medicine now developing, where you can perform, I, I was absolutely taken aback by what I saw an example of uh, uh, a clinic, uh, one of the foremost clinics in this country, uh, which is doing a certain amount of oper extremely advanced uh, clinical operations, conducted offline by people sitting in another country. Machines, the human being uh, is operated by machines that are operated remotely by a specialist in another country. That is fine as long as no one interferes with the networks. And we're going to have more and more examples of this. So this is just the beginning of a debate. Both the freedom on the net and the security of the net are going to be absolutely critical issues for the development of our societies and for the development of our, of our world. Uh, may I finish off this conversation, this utterly hopeful conversation, by mentioning the one uh, utterly impossible proposal I heard was Baroness Worsey's wish that she learn to gain access to the internet faster than her son can. Uh, that will never happen. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you, panel. Great,